how could this despicable man be the choice of a decent people to lead us? He must not be, because he is not us. Because no decent person writes their own version of the Bible and fills it with the documents of a nation that he desecrated, that he burned, and tries to hawk it to grandma and grandpa living on social security, living on fixed income, so he can pocket another shekel. Shameful doesn't begin to describe it. 221 days remain until the American people decide the destiny of their nation. This is the warning. It's Thursday, March 28th. This is Usain Bolt. He was, for many years, the fastest man alive. He still may be. I've never seen anybody faster. This is Felix Baumgartner. He jumped to Earth from the edge of outer space. Nobody has gone higher. This is James Cameron, the famed film director, but just as famously, an undersea explorer. He has been to the deepest point in the ocean, answering a question, how low can you go? This is the thing about Donald Trump when you think about it. For nine long years, how low could he go? Where is the bottom? And he never fails to surprise and delight, as they say. Only the most foolish among us would look at Donald Trump and come to a conclusion really about anything that he can't find a way to get lower, to get smaller, to become meaner, more vicious, whatever. Whatever the vice, Trump can figure out a way to make it hotter. But honestly, I did think that when it came to blasphemy and to degrading faith and to simply mocking it, he had already reached rock bottom. What normal person could possibly think otherwise? Let me take you back to the moment. Trump apparently was in the White House, surrounded by his henchmen and his daughter, the beautiful Princess Ivanka, the high priestess of American nepotism, who went further and higher in political life than any person ever has who didn't deserve to. Ivanka had an idea. Wouldn't it be terrific if those Black people peacefully protesting out front could be cleared so that Donald could march to the president's church, St. John's Episcopal, to do something? Now, there was an impediment to this, and that was the thousands of Black Americans exercising hard-won rights to be equal in America, peacefully protesting in front of the White House against racial injustice. By the way, that's not a threat. That's an act of patriotism. And dissent is as thoroughly an American action as there can be. But I digress. Trump looked out the window at the White House, surrounded by protesting Black people, and he had an idea. He had a question. And he exercised his power. Because the person he asked the question of was the highest ranking uniformed officer of the armed forces of the United States the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a general in the United States Army, Mark Milley. And Trump showed compassion, you see. He did not want to execute the Black people protesting in front of the White House. Merciful 
is he, Christ-like even, some say. No, Trump, because he is a good Christian, nationalist that is, just wanted to see the maiming and wounding of those protesters. He asked if they could just be shot in the legs. If they could just be shot in the legs, maybe most would disperse, right? Now, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff told the President of the United States of America that no, no, the United States military could not open fire on the protesters, shooting them in the legs. Instead, what happened is federal thugs came out from wherever without identification, without badges, without name tags, and they cleared a path beating the protesters. Something else happened that isn't talked about. St. John's is an Episcopal church. And Episcopal priests were at prayer inside the church, inside a sacred space in the United States of America. And they were fired on, tear gassed. So Donald Trump could march across from the White House through that cleared square where violence was done to innocent, peacefully protesting Americans so he could take a picture, a photo. And here's the photo he took, holding the Bible upside down, desecrating it after having done violence in the square where sits the 19th century St. John's Church, the Church of Presidents, a beautiful place, place of active worship, desecrated by the blasphemy of Donald Trump, holding the Bible, a book of faith for millions of Americans who cherish it, value it, hold it holy. And there he is, a president of the United States who professes to be of the faith, blaspheming and desecrating it. But understand, Donald Trump is surrounded by people who desecrate the faith of Jesus Christ. Pastor Paula, grifter extraordinaire, all of these people who worship Trump as a deity, who talk about him as if he is providentially set, this man who has been convicted by a civil jury, effectively of raping a woman and then defaming her. This twisted man, this liar, this blasphemer, this desecrator of God's book and the American Constitution simultaneously. What a sickness has broken out in our land. A sickness of the heart, a sickness of the soul. And it corrupts everything it touches. It corrupts the country. It corrupts our friendships with one another, our family, the truth, and now faith. Because at the moment when it seemed after his assault on St. John's Church that Trump could truly never, ever go lower when it came to the desecration of Christianity, when it came to full-on frontal blasphemy, he went lower. It's a miracle if you think about it. Because once you reach the bottom of the ocean, there's not supposed to be any place to go deeper. But Trump is like an oceanographer who found the door, the portal to a deeper pool a cesspool of disgustingness. The first time 
I ever heard the words, I'm proud to be an American. Like most people who hear it, it hit home. It resonated. It. It's a beautiful song. And it goes way back. Lee Greenwood has been playing it for a very long time. Somewhere along the line, and maybe pretty quickly, though, this went from being a song about America to a song used by the Republican Party to express a love for America. But then that song changed again. And it became smaller and smaller. It became infused with a meaning not about America, but about a mean-spirited faction that used it like camouflage as they preach the opposite values that are even in the song. Apparently, though, Lee Greenwood didn't mind because he went along with it. And now there is a final version of this song. It's reached its smallest version. It's tiniest. It is now the anthem for a desecration, a blasphemous act, scored to music, poisoned by Donald Trump, who, get ready for it, the man who had a fake university shut down, who faces hundreds of millions of dollars of judgments for fraud, for defamation, through multiple court jurisdictions. The accused felon, the accused rapist, the accused harasser and bully. The man who invited the Russian dictator to invade our allies. The man who over and over and over again dehumanizes, calls brown-skinned people animals, calls those that are suffering vermin. You guessed it. He has commissioned his own Bible, the Trump Bible, and you know what? You can buy it today. You could buy a hundred of them today, even a thousand. And boy, wouldn't that shine the light of God on you? A thousand Trump Bibles. Can you imagine the joy it could bring to your life? Even five Trump Bibles. It would be incredible, wouldn't it? And you know what's even better about these Trump Bibles? From this guilty rapist, from this man who desecrated human decency with his meanness and his bullying. Do you know what's even better? Trump has included in the Bible the nation's most important secular political documents, fusing them together. Now, Donald Trump is a historic figure because until Trump, there had only ever been 44 men who had been president of the United States. Short men and tall men, skinny men and fat men, white man, even a black man. Every single one of them, though, did something that Trump couldn't do. They could walk away from power when it was their time because they understood how the country works, how it functions. Instead, what Donald Trump did is what Adolf Hitler did in 1923. He staged a coup. 
He engaged in a criminal act. He incited an insurrection against what was once called the cause, the American Revolution. It is among the most despicable acts in all of American history, if not the most so. It was a crime. It was a conspiracy. And it was singular. Now, let's understand something else. We've invented a lot of great things in America. We landed ships on the moon, sent probes to the outer edges of the solar system, computers, iPhones, automobiles, airplanes, you name it, toaster ovens, ovens, dishwashers, washers, dryers, all invented in America. The list of American inventions is ceaseless, endless, and we're still inventing. But do you know what? The two greatest inventions in all of human history are American inventions, and we know what they are, and it will never change. They're one and two. Number one, the separation of church and state. There is no state religion here. It's the wisest, most revolutionary things the founders did. And then, of course, the greatest idea of all, the peaceful transition of power that endured from 1797 through world war and depression and civil war until it hit the brittle ego of Donald John Trump, the broken little boy who can't ever lose. Because if he does, it must be rigged. And he took a good bit of the country along for the insanity with him. Donald Trump's Bible is a desecration. And purchasing it is the mark of a fool who we should all have pity for and feel great sadness for. And though we may want to walk away from this person because they disgust us or they trigger contempt within us or shame because we know them or we're related to them. We can't abandon these people to this con man because the ideas that he is trying to steal, co-op, take, as he takes everything that he touches, matter. The Bible is a story of redemption and love and forgiveness is a book of wisdom that refutes through that wisdom what Trump is, which is the lowest type of character imaginable. Nobody in America is called to judge Trump, unless, of course, you're on a jury. But every American is called to make a judgment about Trump. How could this despicable man be the choice of a decent people to lead us? He must not be. Because he is not us. Because no decent person writes their own version of the Bible and fills it with the documents of a nation that he desecrated, that he burned, and tries to hawk it 
to grandma and grandpa living on social security, living on fixed income, so he can pocket another shekel. Shameful doesn't begin to describe it. And a country, a nation, a society that cannot grasp elemental concepts of right and wrong, what's true, what's not, is in big trouble. And this is why this week, this story at NBC News mattered so much. Because finally, at long last, eight, nine years into this madness, somebody we all know wouldn't get in line. Chuck Todd did something great this week. Our bosses owe you an apology. He lit a flame, and that quote will endure. And 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it will have a much deeper meaning. Because our bosses will mean a generation of media executives who could not, through their greed, and blindness, understand some elemental truths about America and about this moment and the danger at hand. Journalism is the truth business. It's the fact business. And there are people who are abusive of the truth who will lie monstrously to get something. Something more valuable than money. The rarest of jewels. Power. They want power. And when you see somebody in a constitutional republic that has endured longer than any on earth and longer than any in history that has lit the world, that is the linchpin of global security, prosperity, and freedom, be undermined from within because of a lust for power, by an American named Ronna McDaniel in this instance. That person, after the fact, can't say, oops, this is the nature of the game because it has never been the nature of the purpose of the game of politics to subvert the existence of the Republic under which these parties were born and exist for but one purpose, to strengthen the union. The Wall Street Journal is deeply affronted. Incredibly, the last paragraph of their noxious editorial is this. The tempest over Miss McDaniel suggests the press is preparing to make the same mistake again. This is bad for the country, but it's even worse for the press, which still doesn't understand why it is so mistrusted. How incredible it is. The editorial board owned by the same company that put Tucker Carlson on television. The same company that tolerates Brett Baer in an anchor chair, terrified of telling his audience who won the presidential election. They 
dare to suggest in an Orwellian double speak of double paranoia and lunacy that the defense of truth intolerance for the lie and the liar is what will undermine the credibility of a news media whose credibility has been destroyed chiefly by the antics of their poisonous cousins, the Fox News Channel? Holy shit. It is incredible. It is dangerous. But most importantly, it is real. Just as Ronna McDaniel's lies were real. The election's outcome is not a feeling. You don't get to say, well, it must have been rigged because everyone on my street voted for Trump. It's not how it works. In reality, there is truth. There's a lot of truth in that Bible that Trump is desecrating. And there's a lot of truth in that Declaration of Independence that Trump is desecrating. And there's a lot of truth in that U.S. Constitution that Trump is desecrating and has desecrated and will desecrate again. And there's truth at 30 Rock, the headquarters of NBC, because when the executives, who are no different than the Fox executives or the Wall Street Journal editorial board, just another group of people who are deeply cynical about, well, everything, met up with people who are idealistic, and who mean what they say and have purpose and worth in their work and in themselves. An incredible thing happened. You saw the power of defiance. You saw the power of principle. And now you see the shrill reactions from the shamed and the shameful. Defense of truth, it matters in America. And when you see somebody hawking Bibles who was found guilty by a civil jury of rape, wake up. And if tens of millions of people in this country are prepared to give this man political power again, It must not happen. It cannot happen. And it will not happen. Because Americans are good people. And that's what happened at NBC News this week. Good people. Honest people. People who say what they mean and mean what they said, said enough. And you can still feel the reverberations. 221 days to go until a very big choice is made. Thank you for listening to my political commentary. If you like what you heard today, please also consider subscribing to the Warning Daily Newsletter on Substack.